Obviously, everyone dressed very nicely tonight, but I decided to wear my uniform for work because I am a wild woman. <laughs> this seemed very fitting. <laughs> but I'm going to take you back to the origins of my inner wildness. It was 1968, and my parents were on the road to Panama in their VW Bug. Uh, I picture their orange curtains blowing in the wind. <laughs> my dad in the driver's seat and my mom in the lounge with her perfectly spherical afro because, you know, it was a lounge and they converted the thing into a very mini camper van. And then somewhere around the Guatemalan jungle, my mom, who was pregnant, decided it was time to go back home. <laughs> There's a limit to wildness for all of us. <laughs> so, yes, I was conceived on the road, and I've always been driven by adventure. And that's been the theme of my life, theme of our family. So, here's my dad driving, and my mom in the lounge, and I found myself being less interested in driving and more interested in, of all things, Arco gas stations. <laughs> it's true. There's a reason. Arco gas stations were giving out these tiny uh, miniature figures. And so every time we stopped for gas, they'd give us one of these figures. And I'd march them two by two into our Arco arc. And Pretty soon the thing was overflowing, you know, and if you think about it, probably it was a little hard to pick all those, put all those animals into the ark in the first place, so uh, that's probably pretty realistic. But the thing about them is they had such beautiful names, and they were from such magical places, Oryx and Okapi and Pangolin and Tapir, and I just had to know more about them. What were these animals and so magical? And I, I, I knew right away that that was my calling. But where was I to go? Where was I to go with this, with this news? So I devoted my life to finding out more about these things. It was really my passion. I started reading every book I could find. Uh, if it was about wild animals, I consumed it. If there was a nature show on, I inhaled it. If it was Jacques Cousteau or Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom, I could not get enough. These were the people that I worshipped with religious devotion on our little black and white rabbit ear TV set. <laughs> and I knew I would be one of them one day. If it was Jane Goodall or Charles Darwin or... My favorite, Dr. Doolittle. These are the people that I admired and wanted to become like. And that's what I set out to do. It was a lot of work. I did a lot of field work. I studied ants and roly polies in our backyard and, you know, went down in the canyon looking for baby rattlesnakes and tarantulas. Hey, Mom, look what I found. Um, you know, and then, and then, you know, we'd, we'd go down to the tide pools and I'd poke the sea and enemies and, uh, and, and so much to discover. Uh, in, in loving David Attenborough the way I did, you know, marvelous creatures. <laughs> so that's what I wanted to do with my life. But it came out that school <laughs> got in the way. <laughs> so school, oh, school. <sighs> two plus two, the alphabet. <laughs> I was really a little frustrated. It's, you know, it, it, it was just, it was just, you know, not, not very engaging. But, but it turned out that we had a library nook in the back of the class. It was this hidden little nook and it was a place where we could hide and read, and uh, nobody would notice. 
So um, I adopted that as my own little tree house. Um, and one day when I was back there, I made an earth-shattering discovery that changed my life. I was going through the stacks, avoiding counting or the alphabet or something I'm sure it was very important. Um, <laughs> and I found this book, and it was titled The Code of Life. The Code of Life. And I went, hmm, what's that about? And it turned out it was about something called DNA. What? There was a code of life? <laughs> How come nobody told me about this? So I immediately, you know, I knew the teacher was going to pull me out and make me do something silly. So I dove underneath the classroom beanbag and just sucked that coat of life right in. And then when I came out, when I emerged under that beanbag, I looked around and everyone was gone. <laughs> and the classroom was locked. And I was in it. I must have been five years old. <laughs> Nobody missed me. <laughs> but, you know, that was okay, because I had discovered the code of life. <laughs> so I made that my life's calling. I had to know more about this. So... I started back to school. I, I, I made it just my life's calling. I did everything I could do. So, and as I grew older, I, I started hiking the redwoods of California. I, um, you know, uh, went to the Galapagos Islands and studied the blue-footed boobies, um, wow. rafted the Amazon jungles of, of, of the Amazon, and, um, and had all kinds of adventures that, that set me on the path that I'm on today. But it was, it was my decision then to go to, uh, uh, oh, oh, my, so, so all these adventures that I had, I eventually decided to take a job as a government world, uh, whale, whale watcher in Alaska. So here I was. It, did you ever see that show, A Deadliest Catch? <laughs> that was me. <laughs> it was me and 25 guys at sea for four months on this tiny little boat in the winter, you know, with the ice and, and all of that. And, and, of course, they were very special guys. Um, <laughs> My, the, my predecessor actually jumped off the boat. <laughs> but anyway, my takeaway went from, <laughs> my takeaway from it was, was you know, uh, uh, since I had already been studying all these animals as a child, you know, and I, and I loved David Attenborough um, in, in all these, you know, Jacques Cousteau and Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. Um, I just loved this stuff. And so I used to imitate David Attenborough all the time, you know, marvelous creatures. Um, and, and, and that's, you know, what I like to do. But after getting off that fishing boat, I thought, oh, primitive man. <laughs> <laughs> marvelous creatures. <laughs> I had to know more about them. So I got into a postdoctoral pro uh, program, a, a doctorate program at NYU studying primitive man. <laughs> so, so once again, it was industry that set me on the path to learning about, um, the, you know, the nature of human nature. So I did this, and, uh, and, and, and from, from working with these fishermen, um, I, I, was, I was on fire, you know. And, and I got to go to, uh, to Ethiopia to study these baboons and human evolution, and, and really got into all of these things. Um, and then I, um, I graduated. I, I, what, you, what you find is that, is that life comes along, and you know, no matter how much passion you feel in your life, and, and I had so much passion for my biology, but the passion that you feel in your life, 
gets derailed by, by other life, you know, and especially as a woman. And so next thing you know, uh, my passion did not take me where I wanted it to go. And I turned to some other things. I, I needed some other things to get me to where I wanted to go. And that thing was persistence. Um, I mean, I had spent my childhood watching ants in the backyard and looking for rattlesnakes in the canyon and tarantulas. My mom loved that. Um, we have a, one named Fluffy. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and, and my mom said, hey, you know, if Fluffy ever gets out, we have to move. <laughs> Fluffy was all right, well behaved. But so here I am, you know, what am I going to do? I have plenty of passion, but here's what I know. That passion that I felt was not enough. And you can look at Darwin. Darwin was my hero, my great hero. You know, I love Jane Goodall and Charles Darwin. And my favorite, of course, was Dr. Doolittle. And these are the lives that I emulated um, and wanted to be as a grown up. So Charles Darwin had this wonderful story that really I think epitomized where I was coming from. So he was a naturalist, same as myself, um, and he was in South America, and he was up in a tree, because that's what naturalists do. And so he's there, and he's so excited, looking, looking around, and what does he see but this crazy cool beetle crawling past him? And it's one he's never seen before. So he has to have it. So he grabs it in his hand. Cool. I mean, that's what you would do too, right? Hey, bug. <laughs> and, then, and then this other amazing beetle crawls by, and he's like, oh, I've got to have that one. That one's something special. So he snatches that one up with his hand. He's got two beetles. He's up in a tree. I don't know how he's holding on. <laughs> but then... The craziest beetle comes along of all, and he knew, I mean, being a naturalist, he's like, that one's coming with me. This one matters. So, but what could he do? He's got his hands full. Uh, what could he do? What would you do? <laughs> well, he did the same thing you would do. He opened his mouth, and he put that, he put that beetle in beetle jail. <laughs> right? That's what you would do. And he identified it right away, because he's a naturalist. It was a bombardier beetle. A bombardier beetle is the only animal known to man that produces a boiling hot chemical explosion inside its own belly, which it did, <laughs> right down Darwin's throat. <laughs> and he lost all his beetles. <laughs> oh. It, it's, it kind of takes a bad day at the office to a whole nother level, right? <laughs> <laughs> but so I like to think that, I just, I mean, I love that story, but I like, to, <laughs> I like to think that burning hot heat inside Darwin is kind of the same kind of heat that I feel for my own research, the things that I love to study. So I, I feel a, a real bond with Darwin. Um, and so, so that's what I've done. I've devoted my life to, to studying these sort of things.